Good evening, everyone. In tonight's webinar, we are going to discuss developing an efficient breeding strategy for your farm. Decisions made in the coming weeks will be important to deliver an adequate replacement rate for your farm with high quality dairy stock and also ensuring the remaining stock are of high quality and value. Joining me here in studio are experts in reproductive physiology and genetics from Chagask and ICDF along with John Dwyer, a dairy farmer who is aiming to maximise the efficiency of his breeding season while still delivering high quality dairy replacements and beef stock. Welcome everyone, we are coming to you live from our studio in Oak Park. We have an exciting panel for you tonight and just to remind you that we are taking questions through the Q&A function and we encourage you to ask questions through that throughout the show. Tonight I'm joined here in studio by Professor Stephen Butler who leads the Reproductive Physiology Department in Chagas Moor Park, Dr Siobhan Ring who is a quantitative geneticist with the ICBF in Ballon College and for a practical viewpoint on how efficient breeding strategy plays out on farm we're joined by John Dwyer who is a dairy farmer from between Cashel and the Horse and Jockey in County Tipperary. So we are to start with a presentation from Stephen. So Stephen, I'll hand over to you to tell us about how farmers can maximise the efficiency and performance of their breeding season. Thanks Stuart. Good evening everybody. Tonight we're going to talk about an efficient breeding strategy for dairy herds. Now this change in breeding strategy is going to require a change in both practices and mindset. So for many years, we've done, you know, breeding strategies have been dominated by the, the use of conventional dairy semen and conventional beef semen. So typically, both heifers and the majority of the lactating cow herd were allocated conventional dairy semen for the first three weeks, switching to usually natural service beef bulls for the heifers in the second three weeks, but still a lot of the lactating herd getting conventional dairy semen during the, the second three weeks. And as we move further into the breeding season, more and more beef semen being used. This gave us a calf crop that looks something like this. 27% female dairy calves and 27% male dairy calves. And those calves were born typically in the first six weeks of the breeding se calving season. And the remain remainder of the calf crop then being some sort of a beef cross animal. What we want to change to is using sex semen to produce the replacements and use beef semen then for all the remaining uh, part of the calf crop. If we do this, we will get our 27% female dairy calves. That's just a question of how many sex semen straws do we need to use. But the implication is that the percent of male dairy calves will be down to about 3% and the percent of beef cross calves will be up to 70%. So just on the allocation of sex semen, a question that's often asked is, are all the heifers going to be targeted for sex semen? And the answer should be yes. As a group, they're the best genetic merit and they're also the highest uh, inherent fertility but they must be at target weight now. They must be cycling now, otherwise you will not get good results with sex semen. Another question is, should we be using sex semen on the repeat heats? And in general, the advice would be no. Try and use sex semen, enough sex semen straws in the first round of the first three weeks of the breeding season, such that all your replacement heifers will be born at the very start of the calving season the subsequent year. So I want to talk a little bit about heat behaviour and time of AI because this is, this is maybe something that separates conventional semen use from sex semen use. So if we know the start of standing heat, and we'll call that hour zero, this is when a cow is first willing to be mounted by a herd mate. If we know that, then we have a good indication as to when that animal is going to ovulate. And ovulation is when the, the egg is going to be released and made available for fertilisation. That typically will occur 25 to 32 hours after that first standing mount. And that egg is only fertile for a short period of time, eight to 10 hours. Now, if we take the normal situation where an animal is inseminated with conventional semen and that occurs, let's say, somewhere eight to 12 hours after heat onset, the most important thing to be aware of is that the, the semen is fertile in the reproductive tract for at least 24 hours. So there's, it's really quite easy to ensure that the fertile sperm cells coexist in the reproductive tract at the same time as we have a fertile oocyte or a fertile egg. When we change to using sex semen, the most important thing to be aware of is that that's unlikely to be the case. Most of those sperm cells will not be viable for 24 hours. And if we inseminate early after heat onset, there's a good chance that you won't have fertile viable sperm cells at the same time as when the, the egg is available for fertilization. 
And that's where this advice has come from, to delay the timing of AI when using sex-sorted semen, such so, so that you can maximize the chance that you will have fertile sperm cells at the same time as a fertile oocyte. A number of years ago, we did a fixed-time AI study to try and tease this out a little bit. And this is the protocol that we used. It's a 10-day protocol when you're doing fixed-time AI on cows. Uh, involves a GnRH injection at the start, insert a progesterone device, seven days later, injection of prostaglandin, the following day, on day minus two, another injection of prostaglandin, and removal of the progesterone device. So that intervention, that final intervention there, must occur in the morning time. And then a day and a half later, so five o'clock the following day, an injection of GnRH. And that injection of GnRH is what times ovulation. So that controls the timing of ovulation, and that allows fixed time AI to occur, as indicated on the diagram here, 16 hours later. So in the trial that we did, every cow was treated the exact same in terms of the implementation of this synchronization protocol, and the only thing we changed was the timing of AI. So for this study, 24 herds signed up, each herd giving almost 100 cows each, and within each herd, they were stratified by parity and days in milk and allocated to these different treatments. And the treatments were conventional semen, 16 hours, and the 16 here refers to relative to the GnRH injection, so the normal time after that final injection of GnRH, or sex semen at that same time. Now these inseminations took place at nine o'clock in the morning, which would be the normal standard time with this protocol. But we added in another treatment where we delayed the timing of AI with sex semen only to 22 hours later, so an additional six hours later, and this occurred at three in the afternoon. So if we were to compare this to what happens when animals are being inseminated after observed heat, these would be considered late after heat onset, the equivalent of 16 hours after heat onset, or very late, the equivalent of 22 hours after heat onset. Now for this study, there was only three bulls available. This was before there was any sex semen labs in Ireland. But we did use a split ejaculate technique, meaning that both conventional and sex were, used, were produced from the same ejaculate. And importantly then, every farm got the same mix of each of the three bulls. And then ultrasound was used for pregnancy diagnosis 35 days after AI. This is a question that often comes up. Should we scan the cows that are assumed pregnant? And this is one of the advantages of fixed time AI, whether it's on cows or heifers, you inseminate them all on the same day, they all reach day 35 on the same day, so the ones that haven't yet repeated, it is a good idea to scan those and identify the ones that you think are pregnant, but actually aren't, giving you more time to take action with those animals. This is the overall results from that study. So conventional semen, 61% pregnancy rate, and our two sex semen treatments were between 49 and 51% pregnancy rate. In, so, so overall, you know, they're about 10% behind what was achieved with the conventional semen. On the right here now, what I'm showing you is the herd variation in pregnancy rate. And these, the 24 herds are broken up into groups of eight. We've got the best eight herds, and best here means they perform the best in terms of the relative pregnancy rate. How good the herds did with sex semen relative to how well they did with conventional semen. And as a group, the best eight herds were actually equal. So the relative pregnancy rate there is 100%. They did just as well with sex semen as they did with conventional. Moving further to the right, the intermediate eight herds got, in terms of success rate, about 84% as good. So if we take the first, the best eight and the intermediate eight, as a group of 16 herds, they're over 90% as good for sex semen uh, as they were for conventional semen. So overall, pretty happy. But the sting is in the, the group on the right, the poorest eight herds, where on average as a group, their relative pregnancy rate was only 67% as good. And as you go further and further to the right, the gap between conventional and sex is getting larger. Now, important to note here that for this group of the poorest eight herds, they're poorest for the relative pregnancy rate, how well sex semen performed relative to conventional. But actually, as a group of cows, they did the best with conventional semen. And that tells you importantly that these were well-managed herds, good fertility cows, the synchronization protocol was implemented correctly, um, so the opportunity was there to achieve excellent results. Important also to note that the sex semen that was used on those herds was exactly the same as the, the best eight herds on the left. And for the first time, this opened our eyes to the importance of the management of sex semen on the day of AI itself. It's all well and good to have fertile dams. It's all well and good to have fertile semen straws. But the actual deposition of semen in the reproductive tract is also critical. We did a heifer study in, in over two years in 2021 and 2022. So smaller in scale, 816 heifers on seven farms. And in this one, they were all bred fixed time AI with sex semen. Now for heifers, the fixed time AI protocol is eight days in duration. Uh, pretty much the same interventions as with, as with cows, but the timing is a little bit different. So it starts 
Uh, if we just look at the top protocol there, that was the standard protocol for a number of years. Uh, GnRH injection, insert progesterone device, two injections of prostaglandin on day minus three and day minus two, and then 48 hours later, GnRH and AI at the same time. What we wanted to test was if we delayed the timing of AI, would that be a benefit for sex semen? So the bottom protocol is identical, again, in terms of the interventions. All we're doing is delaying the timing of AI by eight hours. And when we did that, we got an increase in, in pregnancy rate, scanned pregnancy rate, uh, of about 9%, going from 50% to 59%. Now, the overall results here are disappointing, but I will say that on four of the seven herds, the heifers were a bit light, a bit behind target, and it just underlines the importance of making sure that the heifers, if you're going to use sex semen on them, they must have reached all those targets. Out of all this research, we kind of distilled down a bunch of advisory messages for dairy farmers, and you know that, that relates to the bulls, pick a, pick a large team of bulls, uh, use, you pick the highest EBI bulls available. Much easier now that there's sex semen labs in the country than it was just four years ago. In terms of the dams, simple thing here was to pick the top 50% of the herd based on EBI. That should include all of the heifers, but they must have reached target live weight and they should be cycling regularly now. In terms of the cows, you're picking the youngest cows, so no older than parity four. Calve the longest. Th the most important thing about fertility on the farm is going to be how long the cows are calved. So pick the ones that are at least 50 days calved on the day of AI. Good body condition score, cycling regularly, and weed out all the ones that have had postpartum problems. When to use, so like I said at the beginning there, use it in the first three weeks for the management benefits that will bring. Also, it will help, help you to, to recover from any hits in fertility that might occur on your herd. Uh, timing of AI, 14 to 20 or even 14 to 22 hours after heat onset. And if you're considering using fixed time AI, yes, it is costly but it mitigates the risk of using sex semen straws. And it does that by facilitating the targeted usage of sex semen on the farm mating start date. And then on the day of AI itself, straw handling. So the sex semen straws should all be together, thaw two sex semen straws at a time maximum, thawing at the right temperature for the right duration, loading into pre-warm guns, depositing into uterine body, and completing inseminations within five minutes. And there's things every farmer can do to help make sure that happens. If we review some recent field performance, this is some data that Margaret Kelleher and ICBF pulled off from the 2022 breeding season, verified by 2023 calving events. And you can see there's large numbers of inseminations here. So over 300,000 conventional semen inseminations and over, 30, over 35,000 sex semen inseminations. When we look at that, when you just compare the raw data, so if we look at all the conventional semen straws used there versus all the sex semen straws used, we're looking at 57.4% versus 56.7%. And that would tell you that the sex semen was 98.8% as good as conventional. But there's some details there. The sex semen was more targeted at heifers. It was targeted at cows that were calved longer. So when you try to adjust for all that, you get the figures on the right. But still, there's only a 3% difference in uh, pregnancy rate there. So we're still saying that sex semen performed 95% as good as conventional. By way of verification that what we're assuming was a conventional semen insemination and what we're assuming was a sex semen insemination was correct, th here I'm showing you the, the, the percent of heifer calves from those straws. So 49% for conventional, 90% for sex. So verification here that large numbers of herds are getting on very well using sex semen. So how do you calculate the number of straws? So let's take a, an example herd here that has 100 lactating cows and 25 maiden heifers going for breeding. And if we assume that those herds would normally get 70% pregnancy rate in heifers with conventional, 60 with sex, if, if, um, if, if for, the, for the cow herd, 60% with conventional and 50% with sex. So this, this herd wants 30 dairy female calves born. And the remaining calves then can all be beef, and it doesn't matter if they're male or female. For the heifers, we're going to assume that they're all eligible for AI with dairy sex semen. And if we run through the numbers, 25 heifers, 60% pregnancy rate, 90% sex bias, you're going to get 13 or 14 female calves. Equally then, you're going to get one or two male dairy calves. And the remainder then, if we assume 95% final and calf rate at the end of the breeding season, you're going to have eight or nine beef cross calves as well. So the question then is how many straws do you need to use uh, for AI with dairy sex semen on the cows. So we're going to get 13 or 14 female calves from the heifers, so we're going to need 16 or 17 female calves from the, from the cow herd. And when we do the sums on that, we end up needing 37 straws. And those 37 straws will give us our, our requirement for 16 or 17 female dairy calves from the cows. 
We're probably going to get two male dairy calves, and all the remainder then will be beef cross calves. And you look at your calf crop the following spring, 30 female dairy calves, three male dairy calves, and 80 beef cross calves, a mixture of male and female. So in this example, 62 straws were required to generate 30 heifer calves. So the rule of thumb here would be two sex semen straws per heifer calf needed. And that, that's a good target to set. Where are we in terms of sex semen use and the male dairy calf birth rate? So up to 2021, all the sex semen used in Ireland was produced outside of Ireland and brought in. But we're heading into our third breeding season now, 2024, of significant amounts of sex semen being produced in Ireland. Uh, and it looks like this year there'll be well over 300,000 straws available. Where is that going to get us? So in terms of male dairy calf birth rate, if we're using no um, sex semen, we would be having roughly 400,000 per annum. As we move up to over 300,000 sex semen straws being used, it will bring a reduction of about 133,000 male dairy calves being born. Conclusions. Sex and Technologies have, have been operating labs in Ireland since 2021. The first one started in Moor Park. Uh, and that one will close this year after three seasons. Uh, a second one opened in NCBC in, in, in November 2022, and a, second, a, a third one is scheduled to open in Dovea at, in September of this year. So we've had rapid growth in availability and usage of sex semen. Sex semen is a key technology for the Irish dairy industry. It is, however, a fragile product, requires careful use, and I, I've been through the details of that. It will deliver fewer male dairy calves. It will allow you to generate better EBI replacement heifers and also better DBI non-replacement calves. And, and, and collectively, this will improve the sustainability metrics of the entire dairy and beef sectors. And one important last point is, as we move to more and more sex semen usage, the importance of ordering your straws early, having good communication with your AI company about your future sex semen straw needs. Thank you, and back to you, Stuart. Thanks, Stephen, for that comprehensive pres presentation. So while you're coming back to join us there, there are multiple benefits to the use of uh, sex semen, obviously, in terms of the enhanced quality of the replacement stock, which, because it's being very targeted, means we have a lot of less variation in the replacement group. But there's also that very significant benefit of increasing the number of quality beef calves as well. Um, however, I suppose the benefits are coming with a cost. Um, you've, you've highlighted the program that needs to be done there. It adds up, uh, so you're probably talking close to 100 euros between straw and the sink program. <coughs> and myself, my colleagues in the dairy specialist team, and all the dairy advisors are harping on at farmers that they need to watch their cost base at the moment on one hand, and yet on the other hand, then we're saying we want you to spend 100 euro on this program to get these uh, get this sex straw into your he cow or heifer. So, what do you say to people to try to reconcile that? Because we're, we're getting that little bit of feedback about that. Geez, we've spent a lot of money on this, and like, are people just not seeing the benefits of it in terms of money into the hand, but they're, they're realising those benefits and they don't realise that they're realising those benefits? Yeah, well, there's no doubt that <coughs> at this time of the year you're seeing the cost, and that, that's for sure. You know, as you approach the breeding season, it is going to cost more, the straws are more expensive, and if you want to do fixed time AI, that's a cost that you don't have if you're not synchronising. Um, but we've got to remember why, why, we're doing, why we're using dairy semen at all. We're using dairy semen to generate replacements, the male dairy calf is a byproduct of that low value welfare concern. So sex semen is a, is a tool that you can use to minimize that, minimize those numbers. And if there's a concern about a deterioration in calving pattern, synchronization, particularly fixed time AI, will prevent that because it mitigates all that risk. It, it ramps up the submission side. So calving pattern is a combination, it, it's a product of submission and conception. If conception is going to be hit, your mitigation strategy is to ramp up submission. So it, it is an expense, but um, you know, we, we've done the sums on this, we've done the economic comparisons of synchronization versus not, and it does pay for itself, just not this April. Um, so so the, the impact is going to be felt next spring when you have uh, a better value calf crop, first of all, because your, your male dairy calves are gone, replaced by more saleable, easier to market beef cross calves. Um, and then also those, those cows that you, you, you've synchronized for fixed time AI, you're picking the best genetic merit animals, so you're getting accelerated genetic gain within your, within your herd in terms of replacements. And also, they're going to be the first animals to calve on the farm. So those cows will have a longer lactation. So more days in milk and more milk receipts from those cows that you synchronize. So it's not going to, rev it's not going to transform the profitability of the herd, but it will pay for itself. Uh, but, but you'll be waiting until the following year for, to, for that cash to be recouped. And there's that hidden benefit then of the actual genetic gain yeah, that you mentioned yeah, there because you're yeah. being so specific and targeted like we've seen on some farms where we've looked at it, that you are increasing quite significantly mm -hmm. the, the, your, the EBI value of the stock that you're breeding when you're targeting your breeding. So 
profitability is increasing. So effectively, it's it's like vaccinating a herd of cows for something. Like you see the value this or the cost of the spend in the vaccine, but you never see the return for yeah, it. But it's yeah, if you have yeah. a disease outbreak, yes. you know the cost of it. Yeah, so that's yeah. effectively what you're saying. So we're, we're buying milk for next year, effectively. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. worthwhile doing, obviously, uh, from that point of view. I suppose the other question that I have for you then is, uh, and you've, you've given a couple of figures there in the presentation in relation to replacement rate and so forth. So I suppose we've had a lot of replacements in the country with the last few years. Generally, people have had more than they've required. It's kind of created a bit of a heifer sales uh, scenario for people that wouldn't necessarily have wanted to sell heifers anyway. We're talking about 18 to 20, done as always talking about 18 being the ideal figure. What kind of numbers of heifers should people be trying to generate in terms of calves that land on the ground in 2025 to have that kind of stable herd where we're talking about just using that 18 to 20 percent? If we go for 18 or 20, we're going to be short more than likely. So, what's the magic oh yeah, number? Yeah, 18 to 20 now that, that refers to animals that are entering the lactating herd. When I talked about 27% female dairy calves, that's the ones that are being born, right? So that's the calves that are registered as dairy calves. But you, you need some bit of a um, security there in that you're going to have a few surplus because inevitably there will be some calf mortality. There'll be calves that won't go in calf or, you know, as maiden heifers, they won't go in calf. Or if they do, they'll abort and, and they never make it into the lactating herd, right? So there's always that risk. So if, you're, if you want to, to be targeting that you're going to have 18 to 20 percent replacement rate, you would need to have 25 percent of the, the you know, 20, 20, 20 out of 100 cow herd, you'd want 25 female calves being born just because some of those will never make it into the lactating cow herd. Okay, so um, you also mentioned there at the end of the of your presentation about the ordering the straws early. Can you expand on that a little bit more for me in terms of what you're coming at there? Yeah, so it's just a, like a part of the change here is that you know to make these sex semen straws takes a long time. So, for example, the the, the, the straws that are going to be used probably somewhere between the middle of April and, and the first week of May, all of them will be used more or less. And those straws have been being produced since last September, right? So it's taken 24 hours a day, five days a week since last September, right through to date. You know, they'll still be starting until the first week of April um, to get those straws made. So if you go looking for them now, um, there's a chance that they'll be they'll be sold out, and, and what indications are that they will all be sold out again this year. So so all that can be really done is to help the AI companies be more proactive in the numbers that they expect to sell is to make that communication much earlier, and much earlier meaning you know, not, not March, February, January, but, but go back even into the previous year because all you can do is either have more sorting capacity or spend longer sorting. So, you know, is there an ability to start sorting earlier in the year or, or is there a need to bring in more sorting machines into the country? So and, and to be fair to the AI companies, they do not want stock left over yeah. because if it's left over, they still have to pay for it, right? And that, that is a big cost. Um, so, so there needs to be better communication between farmer and AI company about, about what, what exactly is required, and that needs to happen. So effectively, you're saying that the farmer should nearly be saying, I want a particular bull sex rather than saying, I want to buy that sex bull that you have available type scenario. Yeah, um, well, yeah, maybe, maybe. maybe th like, there will be some bulls, I guess, that, that for example, the ones that performed really well in this, this year's breeding season in terms of non-return rate, and also the ones that are they're, they're high BI, they're high demand, they're probably likely to be high demand again next year. But there will be a whole new team of bulls coming on stream next year that we'll know nothing about. And you know, the, the desire, I guess, from an AI company perspective will be to, to leave the decision on sorting those bulls until as late as possible. So those will be the ones you'll be sorting in the springtime, just because they're young bulls and you know, you're waiting for, for more data to accumulate on, on them and their, their, their relatives before you'd have a, an accurate proof on those bulls. Okay, so you mentioned about the sex semen labs there and the fact that there's two of them going to be tied in with the companies now in the next uh, short period of time and that the one that you, you would have started it yourself originally um, is closing down and that was part of the whole process anyway, mm -hmm. that was the plan. Mm -hmm. But like you were a strong advocate for sex semen a good few years ago now before it even got going uh, and I suppose you kind of met a bit of resistance, maybe people didn't think it was going to fly in Ireland really. Um, so it, ha it has started to take off, like I think from what you're saying there, we need to keep pushing with mm. it in order to try to keep driving it. But are there other technologies now, seeing as you have this crystal ball mm -hmm. that you're able to gaze into uh, that people need to be watching out for that are going to help them in terms of breeding efficiency? Yeah, well, in terms of sex semen, I'd say we're at best one third of the way down the, the, the road, right? And there's been a lot of farmer strong advocates for sex semen 
throughout all this research, you know, like the, the, there's been lots of farmers who are willing to t take part in those trials. Uh, and, and without that, we never would have got to where we are today. Uh, in terms of new technologies, I mean, there's, there's some kit, you know, actu actual kit that, that's being put on cows now, all the, the sensor devices, activity meters, you know, they're grant aided now. You know, they're, they're originally designed as a, as a reproduction tool, but they're also very good for animal health, you know, the rumination, grazing, monitoring, um, lying time. You get all that information. It's extra eyes on the herd at all times, and, and that, that's going to be a benefit. Uh, in terms of reproduction, um, you know, I suppose something that's going to be very well married with sex semen. If you're going to use sex semen to generate your, your dairy replacements, um, it's already been commercialized, but this, this idea of the heterospermic uh, straws, right? So, so this is, you're again, part of just risk mitigation more than anything. You're instead of having one bull in a straw, you're putting three different bulls into that straw. And this helps reduce the risk that that particular straw is going to be a poor fertility it would be from a poor fertility ejaculate because there'll be three different ejaculates in there. And I think that'll be, you know, a really important um, add-on to farmers as they, as they, you know, most of the calf crop is going to become a beef cross calf and, and having high fertility beef semen is going to be a critical part of that. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I see those as being the two, two next things that are going to have a big impact. Okay, so um, we'll just park you there for a few minutes and we'll come back to you later on. Um, so Stephen has clearly outlined how we should go about breeding a high quality early born group of replacement heifers with the rest of the herd being bred to beef right from the start of the breeding season. And with nearly 60% of beef of dairy origin now, the quality of beef coming from dairy farms is becoming more and more important. Dairy farmers are ever so slightly apprehensive maybe about the potential increase in both calving difficulty and gestation length and many aren't yet convinced that you can improve the beef merit of the stock from the dairy herd without necessarily impacting on these two very important characteristics. So to address those concerns, Siobhan's going to look at the Dairy Beef Index and how it can deliver exactly what is required for both the dairy farmer and the beef farmer. So I'll hand over to you, so Siobhan. Thanks, Stuart. So tonight I'm going to be talking about maximising beef without impacting the dairy herd. So if we just take a look at where we've come from. So since 2010, I suppose cow numbers have increased rapidly. Uh, by about 57%. So we had 1 million cows and now we're up to 1.6 million cows. Over that same time period, dairy beef calvings have also increased uh, more than double. So I suppose that puts increased scrutiny um, on the quality of those dairy beef calves that are being born, that they need to be of good quality so that they're saleable and that they contribute to a sustainable dairy beef system. So the tools now exist to identify elite beef bulls for the dairy herd, to optimise the matings so that you get, get the best match for the bull and the cow, and also then the tools are there for the farmer who is going to pick up the resulting calves to identify well which calves are going to be the best animals to rear and to finish. So that first tool is the dairy beef index. So the dairy beef index was identified, was, was developed to identify beef bulls of superior genetic merit that are elite both for calving traits, but also, of course, for beef merit. It's expressed in euro values, very similar to like the EBI that dairy farmers will be familiar with. So higher euro values are more desirable and higher euro values within each of the sub-indexes, such as the calving sub-index and the beef sub-index, are preferable. So there is about two thirds of the weighting within the index is based on improving the beef characteristics and one third uh, is for improving those calving traits. So ensuring that, you know, we, we're breeding for easier calving animals that have a short gestation. So within the dairy beef index, what is rewarded is bulls that are easy calving, short gestation and those that have desirable carcass metrics, such as, you know, a heavy carcass weight, a good conformation, those that are earlier finished, etc. So a question that we get often asked is, well, okay, so if I use a higher dairy beef index bull, does that mean I'm going to have harder calvings? The answer is no. So what I've done here is basically I've took a plot, I suppose, of all the AI bulls, all the beef AI bulls that are there, and I'm looking at their calving difficulty and their beef sub-index. So each dot represents a beef bull, and I've just put in a target line here in blue. So this is where we have we're saying that you need to use a, a beef bull with a beef sub-index of at least 90 euro to ensure that you're getting a good quality beef calf. And I'll talk to that in a minute, where that calf will result in a high CBV value, which translates then to when you're selling the animal into the mart. 
So if we set that threshold bar and we look at the bulls that are above that, so what you can see is, I suppose, you, you want to then identify, okay, well, what bulls have you used previously? Look at your different cohorts of animals. So look at your, you know, your first calves, your second calvers, and separate those out from your mature cows. What beef bulls have you used previously? What calving difficulty range had they, and were you happy with them? And if so, use that base, I suppose, as a guideline for the bulls that you'll be selecting for this year. So let's just take, for example, you know, your first calvers and your second calvers, th those that you're putting to beef, which you haven't put, put to sex semen. Say we're going to pick bulls that are, have a calving difficulty figure of below 4%. There are 50 bulls on the active bull list at the moment that have a calving difficulty of less than 4% and have a good beef subindex. If we're then to look at, say, your mature cows and you're willing to tolerate that little bit higher calving difficulty possibility, say in the range of 4 to 6%, you're looking at an additional 400 bulls become available um, by allowing that extra, extra tolerance there. But in essence, it doesn't matter what threshold you're going to set for your calving difficulty, you can sti still find bulls that have a high beef subindex that will give you good calves uh, irrespective of your calving difficulty threshold. And alongside that as well, I suppose the, the Minister for Agriculture is after releasing, uh, launching a new scheme there last week, um, which is basically, I suppose, to financially incentivise the use of these better dairy beef index bulls to improve the quality of the beef calves coming from the dairy herd. There is only one requirement, and that is basically to use a beef bull that has a high dairy beef index, so that's a minimum of three stars in the dairy beef index, but also at least three stars on that beef subindex of the dairy beef index. And for that then there is a payment of 20 euro per eligible calf up to a maximum of 50 calves. So that's something that's available to all dairy farmers. So once you have identified the beef bulls that you're going to use, there is then a facility I suppose within the ICBF website where you can optimise those matings such that you know, the cows that are more prone to calving difficulty would be getting the easier calving um, bulls. The cows that are typically bigger in size, they would be more capable then um, you know, possibly for the bigger bull. So essentially all you do is you identify those cows that would be going to beef, uh, input the bulls that you have selected that you're going to use. Within the background then, uh, the mating program is calculated and what comes out basically is you will get the predicted values for the calf. So what's the expected gestation and what's the expected difficulty uh, and beef merit. And very importantly is this CBV value. So I'm going to talk about that here now in a second. So that will give you an indication, I suppose, of you know, well, well, what's going to be the output of the resulting calf and am I happy with those? And that data then can be sent, can be saved, and it will be sent to your AI technicians, handheld, where they can then pick up that information when the cow comes bulling and they're there to, start to uh, inseminate her. So this CBV, also known as the commercial beef value. So essentially what it is, that where the concept came about from, is you've got a pin of calves uh, in the mart, or a pin, pin of uh, bullocks or heifers, whatever it might be, and you're trying to differentiate, well, which ones are the good ones and which ones are the bad ones, and how can you tell just by looking at the animals in the mart? And it's especially apparent for the very young calves. So this is essentially a tool. Um, you know, it's, it's based off of the... the, the breeding indexes that we've shown you there previously, um, and it's for non-breeding stock. It's available for, uh, d for DNA verified animals, so that's basically just to ensure that you know, the sire has been verified of those animals. So what is the CBV? It's essentially the dairy beef index, so that's the tool that you have been using to select the beef bulls. It is, the C it is that dairy beef index with those calving traits removed. Because if you think about it, once the calf is on the ground, that animal is never going to be bred again. So those calving traits are, are irrelevant. So the CBV is rewarding animals that produce heavier carcasses that are uh, easily conformed, that require less feed to finish, and those that um, are finished earlier in their lifetime as well. So it's expressed as a euro value, uh, similar again to all our other indexes, um, and higher CBV values are more desirable. So where can you find this value? There's a number of places. So um, for farmers using the Herd Plus service, so they can find this on their animal profiles. So all animals that have a sire recorded will, this, will have this profile available to them. So whether they're selling at home or whether they're selling in the mart, they can use this information. 
and it's also available on MART boards as well. So for any genotyped animals, so particularly hers that are participating in the National Genotyping Programme, the CBV value is displayed um, on the MART board as I'm showing you here as an example. Um, and early indications show, show that the CBV value you know, is impacting the price that the animals are being paid for in the MART. So in summary, if you want to breed, I suppose, a better beef calf, which in ultimately results in a high CBV animal, you need to see, I suppose, well, where are you at? So earlier this week, uh, ICBF sent out the uh, EBI scorecards. So identifying, I suppose, letting you know where your herd ranks relative uh, to others. And I've just highlighted here the beef sub-index component. So whatever figure you're coming in at, I've just kind of broken that down into, you know, different rankings um, for herds across the country and seeing, you know, well, where does that, where, do, where does your herd, herd lie? Are you in and around average, bottom 20% or top 20%? And from that then, I'm giving you, I suppose, some, just some rough guidelines that you can use to target, I suppose, well, what is the minimum beef sub-index you would need to use to get a high CBV calf? So I've just highlighted here, I suppose, herds that would have an average dairy uh, EBI beef sub-index of minus five, they would need to use a beef bull that has a minimum beef sub-index of 78 euro to get calves that would be classified as four stars so they'd be like basically, you know, in the top 40% of dairy beef calves born. Or if you want to go better again, you'll be looking to get um, to use bulls that have that uh, beef sub index of at least 116 euros. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to maximize that calf uh, CBV by using the highest beef sub index value available. But while also taking account, I suppose, of the calf and difficulty and gestation limits that you yourself have. So in summary, use the dairy beef index to identify suitable beef bulls. The easy calving bulls with short gestation do exist with the high, high beef merit. There is a new scheme launched to incentivize the use of superior bull calves. And trading, as we're seeing now, is being influenced by the CBV, which is available on mark boards today. And if you want to breed, I suppose, animals that have you know, high CBV to maximize your, your beef value of your calves, Choose bulls that have an acceptable calf in difficulty for the right cows. So that could be a different tolerance for your first calvers versus second calvers and your mature cows. And then from that, you want to maximise the beef subindex um, of the dairy beef index then. So back to you, Stuart. That's all from me. Thanks, Siobhan, for your presentation. So I suppose an important point to highlight is the importance of the Sire Advice Programme, which is a very significant tool in terms of that switch to better beef as it's mitigating against potential calving difficulty in the matchups. And that emphasises how important it is for farmers to both run and then follow sire advice recommendations. So before I ask you a few questions, Siobhan, I'd just like to remind people that they have the option of putting in questions in the Q&A function. And we would really like to get questions in through there. We have a few coming in, one for you and a second, Siobhan, as well. So just my own questions for you, I suppose. 50% of the genetics are coming from the dam and from the sire, obviously, then as well. But people aren't convinced necessarily that because that, we're, that we can compensate for the lack of beef in the dairy cow by in, enhancing the beef on the side of the beef bull. So what would you say to people that are kind of maybe on the fence or a bit fa failing to be con convinced? Yeah, what? so look, I suppose take it back to what you know. So breeding for better beef is no different to breeding for better milk or better fertility. So if you've got a cow who's really poor in milk and you re use a bull who's got a lot of milk or a lot of solids, you will have seen the difference in the progeny and how they end up being superior and they end up being about the average of the two parents. So beef breeding is, is no different. Um, we've done a lot of analysis in terms of you know, the beef breeding and the beef sub-index of the different herds around the country to see, okay, well, what kind of level, um, what, what type of beef bull do they need to use to actually you know, get good calves on the ground? And it doesn't matter whether you know, you're the typical typical Halston Friesian herd or whether you're you know more of a, a, a Jersey cross type herd there are beef bulls out there that will you know fulfill the system and get a good beef calf um, on the ground and that's why I suppose we've given these kind of targets to farmers where they can kind of just use them as a guideline say you know minimum 90 euro beef sub index you know would get you to a four star for you know the typical worth 20 percent of herds um, as a guideline and that will get you that that good beef calf but I suppose it's important to look at where your own herd is at and then you you go from there. 
Okay, so, and then just on the calving difficulty piece, now you highlighted obviously that there's a lot of bulls there mm. that are available at, at low calving difficulty, like because I suppose generally at the dairy bull side, we're looking at maybe two and a half to three and a half percent calving difficulty is what we're very comfortable with. And, and you're not asking people in to go that much higher, but yeah. what would you say to people in terms of um, that calving difficulty piece, like that to, to allay their apprehension around it? Um, <coughs> so look, I suppose a great place to start is well, look at the bulls that you've used last year, and okay, so say they have been really you know low calf and difficulty, and you've had no problems, that's great. But maybe you know <coughs> talk to si talk to your AI technician. They're not going to lead you astray. They're not going to be wanting you to use bulls that are going to cause you problems. So they'll obviously have been in many different herds, um, you know, and they'll be advising on on those herds, and they'll know where the problems would have been. So they won't be you know, pushing you in the wrong direction. And I would say if you had been using, you know, an easy calving bull, maybe you can go l maybe a little step further, I suppose, you know, on the likes of the mature cows, you know, they can handle a lot more relative to some of those younger cows. So it's really targeting the right bulls for the right cows. Okay. And then you talked about the CBV and how it's basically <coughs> nearly sh just the same as the DBI minus the calving piece. Is there a risk that people could be picking bulls on DBI thinking that they're going to get a high CBV and not actually get it? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So this is where the communication, I suppose, is really important. Um, so I suppose the CBV is, is really the, the pinnacle really from a sales perspective because that's what the buyer coming into the yard, whether it's a calf or a waning or whatever it might be, that's what they're going to ask for. So what you're really trying to do is is get is breed for an animal that's going to give you a high CBV, but of course you don't know that um, when you're picking your bulls because you're also focusing on calving and gestation. So that's I suppose when, why we're trying to target the message this year that you know pick the gestation that you're comfortable with and the calving difficulty, and then drill into the dairy beef index and pick within that beef sub index. So it's no different to what you would have been doing, I suppose, with the, you know, when you're picking your dairy bulls, you would, you know, you'll say, okay, well, if you're not great on health, I need to do better on health this year. So that's kind of what we're saying. Drill into the beef sub index, but make sure you're happy and comfortable on those calving traits. Okay, and one of the questions coming in from the audience there, Patrick's asking, is, um, do the calves have to be genotyped in order to have a CBV? So all calves will have a CBV provided, this, provided the animal um, has you know, was registered with a sire at birth, but in the marts, the animals will have to be genotyped, yeah. So it's pretty much, I suppose, what you'll see is that the genotyped animals and any farmers involved in the National Genotyping Programme, the CBV will be displayed there. And the reason for that, I suppose, is just, you know, to verify that, like, we would have seen in the past, I suppose, particularly with the dairy beef calves, that there would have been a lot of parentage errors. So we're just, I suppose, with this new tool that's there, we're trying to make sure that what goes up in the mart is, you know, we can be we can be damn sure that that is the right sire. Okay, so, and I suppose the importance of that scheme that you mentioned there in your presentation as well, in terms of driving, the, the, like it's focusing on the beef traits, which is going to try to yeah. deliver that high CBV calf, the, the scope, like the, what's the kind of capacity in terms of numbers of farmers there, 50 calves per herd that's involved, is that, is that going to cover all the farmers in the country effectively? Yeah, like I, I'm, I'm not sure of the, those specific details now, I suppose, look, we'll, we'll refer that one, I suppose, to the department, but I suppose it's not to be sniffed at at all, and you know, like you've mentioned there with Stephen about the cost of sex semen, this is certainly something that's going to offset it, like 20 euro by up to 50 calves, that's, that's a lot of money, you know? Okay, very good, so... Now that we've discussed the theory with Stephen and Siobhan, what does this look like when it's uh, described on farm? So John Dwyer is striving for an efficient breeding season on his farm, and we're going to discuss this with John in a moment. But before we do, we have a short video to give you an idea of the farming system that John and his family are running on their farm in Tipperary. Uh, John Dwyer is my name. I'm farming here in Ballytarson between the horse and jockey and cattle. We're milking 190 cows last year. The milking platform is about 68 hectares. They would have produced 520 kilos of milk solids at like 463 butter fat and 370 protein. Mainly the herd is basically a high EBI herd. Uh, the herd EBI um, was it's 245 at the moment and the young stock coming through, the replacements are about 30 ahead of that, so around 275. We all AI bred here. We have no stock bull on the farm for the last um, seven or eight years. The mating start date is the 29th of April is the planned start date for the cows. 
and the heifers are planned uh, for a fixed time AI programme on the 1st of May. The cows will be bred as they are seen in heat once a day AI. Um, there's, I'm using all sex semen on the, the top 50% of the cows this year. So, and then the heifers will be getting probably, I'd say 80 or 90% of them will get sex semen and maybe I might use a few beef bulls on the lowest DBI heifers as well. I'm using the, the D, high DBI bulls. I'm trying to select more on the carcass, trying to get a bigger frame of a calf. I had no difficulty this year with calving and our calving ease was fine. I would sell a lot of the bull calves here off farm at three and four weeks of age. I have a few neighbours that buy bulls off me here and I'm trying to improve the stock as much as possible to, as, as thing has gone on to, to have repeat customers. We're trying to just keep improving the quality of the beef calves that we have coming off the farm here. Looking at the different traits of the bulls, the kgs of the carcass kgs and the um, I suppose calving ease and gestation, all those things are coming into play. The plan for 2024 is that we will uh, tail paint all the cows on the 1st of April and do a pre-breeding recording for three weeks. Any cows that haven't been seen cycling before the, the mate and start date will get the vet out to check those cows over and try and get them cycling as quickly as possible. So John, uh, I suppose when we asked you to come here a couple of weeks ago, we weren't expecting to be dealing with the conditions that we're dealing with at the moment. Uh, or to be as challenging, I suppose. So what way are things on your farm at the moment today? Uh, it's very challenging now, sure. This week is really after, you know, it's putting the nail in the coffin, really. Like, we've 30 mils of rain at home since um, since Sunday evening. It's more rain on top of wet ground. It's making it very difficult for everyone. Um, I suppose we all have to kind of look out for each other at this stage because everyone's in the same boat now. Silage stocks are running very tight and we're all looking for the, the sun to come out as quickly as possible. So I suppose uh, just coming back on what we asked you in to talk about tonight in terms of the, the efficiency of your breeding, like you're striving for that high six week calving rate and I think over the last five years the lowest you've been is 81 or 82 percent. I suppose when we're doing meetings and Stephen you probably meet it as well I'm sure, the argument that we get is like handling this 90 percent in six weeks is very challenging on farm. How do you, like year after year you're doing this? And it is part of your efficient breeding in terms of once you achieve that, it makes your actual breeding season a lot easier to do. How do you manage it on the farm? Yeah, it is. It's sure the first week, the first few weeks of calving are always they're heavy going. Like you're always waiting there to see when the first one's going to land, and you're thinking about that. But once they come, then you're you're into the groove. But I suppose one of the benefits of the sex semen over the last couple of years is that the the calves, the, your 90% of the calves early are heifer calves, there's no calving issues. Cows are calving quickly and easily, and you're getting the cows, you're, there's no I extra work with that. So you can take the calves away and bunch them up. Um, and this year then I adopted a um, once a day milking for the first three or three and a half, four weeks. Um, that took a nice bit of workload off in the evenings as well. Um, so it's it's nice to have a tight tighter cabin and you give the calves and the bunch of heifer calves there are all together then as they're as they're going through the year one and two then uh, you're you're mo like there's a good chance you're going to get them all calved at 22 to 26 months then in two years time is, is that an important point as well Stephen I, th I think you probably did make in your own presentation but that compact group of heifers as well in terms of achieving the targets for breeding in 12 months time in yeah, John's case and, and, and John kind of alluded to it there but it is a good point that it's hard to put an economic value on that, but the, just the fact that these heifers are going to be the first calves born, they're born in clean sheds, there's very little chance of uh, you know, disease problems in those, in those animals, and if they're staying at home to be reared or they're going to contract rare, at least you know they're going to be ready by this date. And, and everything after that then is a beef cross calf and then you can try and forward sell them to, to somebody else. But in terms of replacements, yeah, of course, they're all going to be at least 15 months of age by the time they're being bred themselves. Lots of opportunity for growth, you know, reach their target weight, be cycling, have multiple cycles before the breeding season begins, giving them good conception rates at their first service so that they'll be calving down at the very start of the calving season themselves as first lactation cows. So, so hard to quantify the economic value in that, but in terms of management, it is a, it is a big thing. Yeah, okay. 
And John, like you're compact, as I said, high six week calving rate, but you're actually talking about trying to trim a little bit off at the end as well. So you're really going for the juggler in terms of efficiency around breeding. Yeah, but last year I think we bred for 11 weeks, maybe like up to that we would have been breeding 12, 13 weeks. But um, I suppose the main aim is to try and get a break between the, the end of calving and the start of breeding there in April to have a maybe a two week window where there's a bit of a, there's a, a gap where you can reset and then get into the frame of mind for the breeding again. Uh, I think we have maybe 10 cows left to calve and it's maybe half of them will be calved by the end of maybe the f next week and then the last five will probably be calved before the 10th of April hopefully. So then that will leave us with maybe nearly the bones of three weeks there where we can kind of concentrate on pre-breeding, heat detection and trying to start thinking about the breeding like it's hard at the moment with the way the weather conditions are but mm. we still have to get into that frame of mind because it doesn't belong coming about either yeah okay and i suppose um that that pre-breeding piece you mentioned it there in the vt as well like uh, that you're very uh, keen on that in terms of trying to get the cows checked before you actually start breeding yeah sure especially when i'm going to be using sex semen and uh i'll use sex semen on all the heifers probably and Maybe as Stephen said, if there's some of the heifers aren't, aren't up to target, I might just leave them and just put them in a beef straw, but I'd still probably put them on the program, all right. But uh, there's no point in putting sex semen into cows that aren't cycling, like, so I'd probably tail paint towards the end of next week, maybe, and record, just keep an eye on the what's whatever hasn't the tail paint gone after the first, after three weeks, then we'll have a week then to get them sorted, get the vet out, scan, or have a look at them and see they're not going to be candidates for sex semen anyway, but the I'd probably target the sixty top sixty percent of cows for the sex semen, and uh, we'll be using the beef straight away as well because some of the cows won't fit into the window as Stephen was saying between the fourteen and the the twenty two hours post kind of standing heat. Like we'll probably keep an, try and keep an eye on that too. That we'll try and give the cows that are getting the sex semen the best possible chance of holding to that, that, that service. Okay, and I suppose Stephen, just would you comment on, we'll say John's approach this year now, we'll say for logistics reasons effectively, is he, he's not going to be able to do the, the synchronization with the cows, he's doing it with the heifers. So he's once a day AI, the logistics around managing that and the sex semen together, so. Yeah. So, so what time of the day, John, will the AI be done? Um, in the evening time, five o'clock. Okay, so five o'clock. So if we work back 22 hours before that, so animals first standing in heat at seven o'clock in the evening to, to, to 14 hours gets you to about three o'clock in the morning, right? So that first standing mount from seven in the evening to three in the morning. Now you might be able to take a look at these animals in the evening time for the week or 10 days that you're doing the sex semen and identify who's on heat from seven to, to, to that last check. But then the next morning, you'll have a lot of animals where the tail paint is mostly gone. Maybe they're still mounting, but you'll have to kind of assume that, well, she's probably been in heat since two, three, four o'clock in the morning. Um, and those are the animals then that you'd want to be targeting for sex semen at that evening. And, and I guess there's another thing to think about that, you know, you, you know from the middle of the day onwards that they're, they're kind of going off heat, you know, that, they're, that that's another thing to think about that, yeah. you know, if, if they're in strong heat in the morning, but they're still in strong heat at four in the evening, well, she's not a good candidate, yeah, right? So, so you just, you target those with the yeah, meat then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, and then, and then once you get beyond your, your allocation of sex semen you want to use in the cows, then you're back to once a day AI with, with, yeah, with all sure conventional beef. With the sex, as you say, it's, it's probably only 10 days, so yeah. that extra check in the evening time would be worth it if you can, if you can get the yeah. conception yeah. rates exactly. high. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Right. And I suppose, John, then there's some smashing beef calves there in the video. Um, how far are you willing to go in terms of the calving difficulty piece? In well, this year now, I would say, well, last year I used a lot of uh, Charlie Limousine, Belgian Blue, and I think their their calving difficulty would have been in what you were saying, maybe the uh, 5 6%, 7%. And if you'd I target those um, bulls on, the, say, the the third lactation to maybe six, you know, the, the kind of middle third, maybe third, third lactation plus that. Like. And I had no, I touch wood now, I've had no ver difficult calvins at all this year. Mm. Um, some would, I would have 30% of my herd would have a, um, some, some Jersey blood in them. And I find that uh, the, 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 the benefit of this, the high DBI and the bulls that really benefit them, say the Belgian blues and limousines, the ca those cows are very easy, they're, they're very good to calve, ca ca calve anyway, but I'm getting a very good straight calf out of those, they're really straightening them up, and 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll target the beef, the uh, during the gestation length. I'm not too worried about it because I'm using those. Maybe they might be a little longer, and uh, but I'm using a lot of those straws in the first three to four weeks of breeding, and then we can target the at the end of the se season. Then we can maybe go back to maybe looking at a shorter gestation bull for the last three weeks of AI. I don't have any stock bulls, so it's all AI, all AI um, on the farm. Do you find that challenging then at the end of the breeding season in terms of uh, when you're yeah sure you're can like, like there's yeah. less there's, there's lower um, activity lower activity yeah. so last year like I tail paint and top up the tail paint for once or twice a week for the ten or twelve weeks and maybe at the lat for the last three weeks then maybe I usually do a pre breeding scan or a mid season uh, scan as well in the middle of ju June, so that would give you, you could kind of focus your attention in on the cows that haven't, that are not seen, that are still not um, in calf, and maybe put stickers on those cows, or scratch cards on, yeah. on those cows, and it might show, it, there'd, there'd be a better chance that you might see, because as the paint, there's less activity, the paint wouldn't be rubbing off as quick, but I found that worked well last year. Very good. Um, I suppose, Siobhan, you're in case you think you have no questions for you, the audience seem to have a lot of questions for you, so, and uh, one question here is going to be a tough one for you to answer. What's the value of a, of a calf at four weeks of age with a CBV of 150 euro? All right. I'm in the mark so am I? <laughs> yeah. uh, look, geez, that's not a straightforward question at all. Um, sure, depending on the time of the year, supply and demand. So if you've got, if there's a heap of calves in the mart um, and there isn't demand for them, the boats aren't going, you're not going to get a great price. Um, but the best way to probably answer it is, is what you say is it CBV 120? 150, yeah. Uh, 150, whatever. Compare that to uh, a calf that has a CBV of 100. What, what we're seeing there is the calf with a CBV of 150, which should be 50 or more profitable in their lifetime um, than that animal at 100, uh, with the CBV of 100. So if you want to pay that extra 50 euro as a calf, then you can do that. Um, it's, that's essentially what it means. But again, it's all down to supply and demand. And it will take, I suppose, a couple of years for this to kick off and for people to see the value in this. But I suppose the, your best chance of getting the best value for your calves and to ensure sale is by upping that CBV as much as possible. So having the, the quality of calf to sell in the first place, yes, really. Exactly. Think, yeah, okay. So another tough one for you now, again, I might be able to help you with this one because I saw the board today. I'm sure you showed the board there in your own presentation. I think it might be in my head. If you have a beef index of minus 14, what beef sub-index bull should I be aiming for? Oh, jeez. I don't remember my figures now. Okay. Right. I think, uh, so, look, for most herds there, you're looking at, you want to be at least, you know, probably m for that kind of herd there, I'd say it's about at least 110 euro yeah. on, be on the dairy beef beef sub-index. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that's a baseline. So, again, it's the same message. Choose your calving difficulty in gestation and use the highest beef sub-index you can then. Yeah, and, uh, and that is a very real possibility for people. So, like, they, they're not comfortable, we'll say, with the 6% or the 5%, like Janice said, yeah. they're, they're happy with 4%. But there are, like there's you can see from the there. graph there, there are bulls there yeah. that are, have the ability to do it. So it, it's, it, there's no excuses mm -hmm. really, isn't there? That's it. Um, and I suppose the other question that I want you to answer then as well is, does the gestation length apply just to that breed or is it across the breeds? No. So the gestation length that we display on the website and on the catalogues and everything else, it's, the, it's from the same evaluation. So a bull that's plus one days will is expected to carry one days and if it's minus three days it's expected to have a shorter gestation of three days so it's the the same figure as well that you see in the dairy bull so negative is more desirable and plus is is, is unfavorable but it, it doesn't matter what the breed is it's the same trait that you're that you're looking at okay and so Stephen I suppose um, one question that I <coughs> have for you as well is in relation to um, using the sink programs we'll say for problem cows and so forth and there seems to be a perception, and I don't know why it is, but like, the, like John is doing the right thing in terms of his pre-breeding check there and identifying those cows early and getting in and sorting them out early. But there seems to be an approach there to, shall we see how the first three weeks go and if we'll deal with the problems after that. That obviously is going against what you said in earlier about trying to drive that submission rate, which when you combine with conception rate and so forth is, is, is resulting in the six-week calving rate. So... In effect, by taking that approach, you're leaving your six-week calving rate slip. Is that fair to say? Yeah, well, you know, it, it's, not, it's not that long ago that the main outlet for synchronization was actually the, the non-cycling cows, the late calvers. That's the, they were the animals that were being targeted. 
uh, and it's kind of switched in more recent years to target fixed time AI at the most fertile animals to facilitate like semen usage. But I mean, you're totally right. the, the cows you have are the cows you have, and you want to keep them in the herd, and you want to keep them calving, preferably in the first half of the calving period, uh, ideally February. But but if they're a late calver this year, how do you change that? And it's not going to change by not being proactive. So so to take a March calver, make or February calver, or take an April calver, make or March calver will require intervention. So. You know, like it's pretty easy now with most of the cows calved or in another week or two to sit down and identify who are the cows that had problems. And that could be anything from difficult calving to retained to milk fever, metabolic problems, early post calving, mastitis, metritis, all these things. Hopefully that's a small list, but that's the list of animals that are worth getting examined before the breeding season begins. If you're doing pre-breeding heat detection like John is talking about, just put on tail paint, check it once a week, get that list of animals that, that is not removed by, by mating start date, include them in the list of animals to examine. And out of that, you'll identify d different treatments that different animals require. So some of it is going to be synchronization, fixed time AI, get them bred in the first three weeks of the breeding season, ideally closer to mating start date. Um, and some of them might require a washout or, or something else. I mean, there could be other things identified here as well. Um, and then for some of the late calvers, they won't be eligible to be bred on mating start date. You, it, they need some time for recovery, to, to, for things to, to return to normal themselves. So you're looking at another date to synchronize these real late calvers. And that could be for three weeks after mating start date, or maybe four weeks. But, but unless you do something, those cows will drift and drift and drift, and maybe eventually be picked up by a stock bull, or maybe just drift out of the herd having not got pregnant and called for fertility failure. But that, there's a cost there, you know, there's mm. big money invested in getting a heifer to calving down for the first time. So you want to get that five and a half lactations out of every animal. And you talked about 18% replacement rate, but 18% replacement rate only works if every cow is giving five and a half lactations. Okay. So, so you, you know, it is important that that's achieved. Yeah, Siobhan, the difficult questions are all for you tonight. Um, and, and maybe you can understand this, because I'm not maybe understanding this question properly, but what is the difference between the beef sub-index in the AI catalogs and the dairy beef sub-index? Um, okay, so the beef sub-index in the dairy beef index, so the, we'll just say the beef sub-index for the beef bulls is not like, those figures don't necessarily compare like for like 100% with what's the beef sub-index in the dairy EBI or in the EBI scorecard that you'll be looking at. So there's a couple of differences and unfortunately like they're actually probably even too detailed to get into now, but in simple I suppose the EBI doesn't include feed intake. Um, it does include cull cow weight, so th there are two traits alone that are different, um, and that then means that you know, if you've if you've a cow with a beef sub index of ten euro and you've a beef bull with a beef sub index of ten euro, there's a slight difference between the two of them, but I wouldn't be getting hung up on it. It's basically the lower your own beef sub index, kind of the higher you need to go when you're picking a beef bull. So. That's the, the, the same message. Okay, and final question for you, John. Then the calves that you're selling to the neighbours, uh, say, are you making all the decisions around the beef bulls there? Or are they looking for particular breeds from you in some cases? Um, yeah, and the, well, I'm kind of making a lot of decisions, but some does a they're kind of looking for more beef, like la like I suppose that the fact that they know that there's this um, is available. These the bulls are available. They're they're looking for the better calf, like they're, they're, they can see the value in the to get the continental calves and, in, and and the mix of the Angus and Hereford as well, like they're some guys are, they, li they like the Angus and Hereford because there's a bit of an earlier finish on them too, like so there's, I sold a few 10 calves to a man last Saturday and there was a, there was a combination of all the breeds like so. Okay, so. A bit of a mixed bag. <laughs> Very good. So uh, I suppose we have to wrap it up because we're out of time. So thank you, Stephen, Siobhan and John for joining me tonight and sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Um, before I finish, I would like to thank the Chagas Dairy Specialist team and the Chagas Dairy Advisors who have been contributing to tonight and all other aspects of Breeding Week this week. And of course, a big thanks to our production team of Declan McArdle and Rachel Gregan, without whom there would be no broadcast, of course. So we encourage you to go after that breeding efficiency that we have discussed tonight and follow the approach that John is taking on his farm breeding high quality replacements from his best stock and high quality beef from the remainder of the herd. Before I finish, I'd like to advise people that there will be another webinar next Tuesday, April 2nd at 7.30 to address the major challenges facing farms currently in light of the seemingly endless rain that we've had to deal with in the last few months. We'd encourage people to tune into that for guidance on how to navigate through this very difficult period of weather. So thank you very much for tuning in tonight and we wish you all the very best with the breeding season ahead and a happy Easter to you all.